Okay, well, I um, wanted to uh, welcome you all to our discussion on uh, thriving and surviving in a pandemic. This is a part of St. Columba's um, Fall Forums. Uh, as you perhaps heard uh, me and Ledley say, we decided um, Molly Reynolds and um, Elizabeth Pike and uh, Terry Dowd are all on the committee. We decided to, to tackle the easy things this fall, <laughs> you know, um, politics Whoa. and race and the election <laughs> and um, mental health during the pandemic. <laughs> but uh, such are the times. So we're so thrilled to have you join us. A couple of um, um, crowd rules sounds too elementary school teacherish, um, but we're well, we're recording right now, and we'll record the kind of presentation um, uh, from our speakers. And then when we get to the question and answers, especially when the questions kind of get um, uh, personal, we'll cut that off. So the people who couldn't be here um, will be able to see the video and um, get some of the golden nuggets uh, that we'll talk about. Um, in just a second, I will mute everyone and take away your ability to unmute yourself just for sound quality control. And then when we get to questions and answers, I'll unmute everyone. And um, if you could like kind of indicate or raise your hand and we'll, we'll keep it somewhat orderly, but um, it is wonderful to have you all with us. Uh, let's, um, Molly, in fact, if you could uh, start muting um, uh, everyone, that would be great. And uh, I will, uh, start with a uh, prayer in just a second. Uh, there we go. Um, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this parish family scattered as we are. We thank you for a chance to gather, to listen to one another, and to fellowship but also to take seriously the whole of our bodies. We are called to worship you in mind and body and spirit. You have made all things holy and it is your desire that we not only survive but thrive in this world so that we may bring your kingdom into a reality um, of our lives. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds to each other uh, as we go forward together. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so um, a special welcome to uh, Karen and Marjorie, our uh, co-conveners of this discussion. For those of you who don't know, um, Karen Strider is a licensed clinical social worker. She is currently a child and family therapist with the Linkages to Learning Program at Weller Road Elementary School in Silver Spring. She also recently joined the uh, private practice group McClellan Counseling Center, where she will see both child and adults. Karen and her two sons have been members of St. C's for about eight years. She's from Kentucky, grew up Southern Baptist. Um, Karen and I share a similar background there um, and is thankful to have found the Episcopal Church also true. For me. <laughs> uh, Marjorie is a psychotherapist in private practice working with individuals, couples, and families, and has been a member of St. C's since 1998. So thrilled. Oh, sorry, 1988. I don't want to show more years. You right. A decade. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thrilled to have you both here. Um, we've asked you to uh, talk to um, the parish about um, this ongoing uh, time of uh, difficulty and stress and how to not just survive, but to, to thrive through it. So we are thrilled and honored uh, to have you as professionals um, address this. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I think Karen and I decided that I would start and segue to Karen. So, um, well, uh, just to name it, we're in a crisis. I don't think that's news to anybody, but I wanted to underscore that crisis involves both risk and opportunity. And that's 
what we want to focus on today is what are the risks, what are the opportunities. One of the things that I'm mindful of is that this is this crisis is having a differential impact on people, not just for socioeconomic reasons, which are really stark, um, but also for different kinds of households. And I think the biggest and most problematic in the sense of challenging um, risk is to families where both parents work and there are school-aged children, more than one school-aged child at home. I, I can't imagine how people are coping with that, but they are. Uh, but the, the demands on, on parents to become teachers while they're doing their work, while they're managing the household it is beyond comprehension. And uh, people are very resourceful and creative, so they've figured out ways to make that work, but I'm daunted when I think of that. I, for example, have a much simpler situation. I live by myself. So this has actually been surprisingly refreshing for me. Uh, I do the kind of work that can easily transfer to video conferencing. Um, not my favorite modality, but we've uh, many most clinicians have adapted to it, and it actually works remarkably well. Um, so I'm lucky, and I'm very aware that I'm lucky. Um, but on the other hand, <laughs> this is uh, a weird time because, for some of us at least, um, to feel so at risk because of the pervasive threat of the virus, and yet also to have very little actual immediate exposure or encountering of the impact of the virus is a paradox that is psychologically bewildering, I think. I know some people maybe two or three circles out in my own little microcosm, social microcosm, who have been directly affected by COVID, but I, don't, my family is okay, my friends are okay. Um, so living in this state where you feel that you're at risk, but the risk is sort of invisible, not just because it's a virus, but because it doesn't seem to directly intrude on your life in a immediately dangerous way, even though your whole life has been turned upside down because of it. It's a, there's, there's some, real psychological challenges to keeping your balance in that. Um, so one of the things that I've been aware of also through this time is that there are some positive surprises that can come out of it, negative and positive. I think it exposed this kind of impact on our lifestyle, on our daily life exposes cracks that may have always been there, but not ones that we've attended to, cracks in relationships, cracks in one's own sense of well being. But it also exposes or generates or activates new capacities, you know, creative capacities that people might never have experienced or had cause to connect to um, prior to this sort of experience. Um, so you might have thought, for example, that as an extrovert, you would really miss in a, in a very acute way, being able to come and go as you please, being able to have social interactions um, with people you love. And um, I'm gonna, well, I guess I can't turn, I'm trying to hide myself for you because I find that to be very distracting. Um, there we go. Uh, that you will just sort of be overcome by sorrow for all that has been disrupted and all the things that you're missing in terms of connecting with people you love. But you could be surprised that actually you can feel quite content uh, in, in just connecting in different ways and that it doesn't depend on in-person encounter. Uh, that's been a real surprise to me. I think of myself as very extroverted. I've been very content just sitting in my chair, looking out the window, doing my sessions day in and day out. March feels like October. October feels like March. There's a sort of continuity of the flow that is bizarre. 
Um, but it, I'm not upset. Now, I think for other people with different circumstances, the upset is constant. And especially again, if you are dealing with with children, if you're trying to help your children cope through this too. So there are lots of um, resources, by the way, that you could find either through your own experience or online about coping with situations like this. And the CDC has a list of things um, about coping. They, I, I would say they fall into, most of these fall into the category of maintaining balance, having routines, having structure. We know there's a correlation between mental health stability and structure. Um, if your usual routines have been completely thrown up in the air, then developing new structure can be very important, which has to do with nutrition, diet, all the things we were always told about, right? But now we take on particular salience, um, exercise, maintaining a support network. Um, one of the, the focuses also is on staying informed but not being consumed by news to really limit your exposure to news feeds uh, because that can totally up your anxiety. But on the other hand, feeling informed can help you have a certain measure of control uh, or feel like you do at least. And one, one area of risk is that these kinds of circumstances can lead people to drink more alcohol, um, to use more marijuana, to smoke more. So I think monitoring your behaviors around that can be really important. And if you find that you're um, increasing in an extreme way, then that's something to, to take hold of, either to talk with someone about it or to um, experiment with cutting back yourself and, um, and substituting something. Uh, I think binge watching TV programs is okay. I was very surprised to be totally caught up in every manner of cop show uh, because it seemed to me that the good guys usually won even if they were cops. And uh, so in this day and age, that's a little off, uh, off center, but uh, in firemen, and then Grandchester, I highly recommend Grandchester because it integrates the theological with the soap opera um, of life. So, you know, you can experiment with things that, that help you uh, feel like you can keep on keeping on. And one thing that I think is very important that I would recommend is find something that makes you smile every day find a picture that lifts your heart. I have a picture of the, I don't know if you saw that the um, zoo in Chicago let the animals wander around and meet each other. I have a picture of a penguin encountering the beluga whales and belugas have these natural smiles and the penguin is standing in front of the, the aquarium and the belugas are leaning in, getting through. It is just every time I, that's my screensaver. Every time I see it, my heart, lifts. So find something that really gives you a sense of the joyfulness in life, despite all that's going on, despite the chaos all around, uh, on every level of our society. And, and just take a moment to experience something that, that makes you feel glad that you're alive. Um, watch movies that make you happy. Uh, I highly recommend the Mr. Rogers movies, <laughs> the Tom Hanks one, which is just so quietly powerful, and the documentary. I mean, things like that, that just remind you that, that there are people in the world who have given of themselves and are so generative that, that you, can, you can partake of that, and then you can give that as well. Um, 
The other thing that I think is really important is service. When we're so caught up in how our lives have been totally disrupted, being able to think about the needs of someone else, I think can really be um, healthy and health giving. And so find ways to be of service, um, whether it's about the election, whether it's about animals. Um, I love that so many people have adopted pets now. I hope that they keep the pets once the pandemic is over, but just the, the doing something that is beyond yourself, I think is a great antidote to um, despair. And rely on the wisdom of the ages. You know, we have a lot of wisdom in our Christian tradition uh, that we can connect to. I think Henri Nouwen is a wonderful resource for times like this. I haven't read all his books. He's on my list, but one that I really want to get to is the Genesee Diary um, that you might really find useful for, because this kind of time, someone else referred to this as a sort of retreat time. I, if you're lucky like me, it can be a retreat. If you're a parent with little kids, I doubt that this feels like a tr retreat, but, <laughs> um, but reading the wisdom of the ages, because I was thinking, you know, this is such a chaotic time. It's unprecedented. And then I thought, well, <laughs> no, there have been many times of chaos in human history and somehow people have gotten through it. So learn from them. Um, so let's see, I think I should close. Let's see if there's any other specific thing I wanna offer. The issue of gratitude, which I think is li linked to feeling the joy, um, but really being mindful of what you're grateful for despite these circumstances. Um, if you find that you are experiencing unremitting anxiety and that it persists, for more than a part of the day, for more days in the week than not. And it persists in an undiluted form for two weeks. That's the threshold. Then, then get some help. Um, call on a therapist and, and learn more sort of directly how to manage that anxiety. Um, some things to think about with anxiety are, are self-care really take care of yourself in the ways that I referenced earlier about balance and structure and routine. Um, and know your limits. So a lot of times people get caught in this day and age in the idea of shoulds. Well, so-and-so cleaned out their whole attic. I should clean out my attic. Uh, so-and-so has totally redesigned their house. Um, I should do that. You don't kind of let go of the shoulds. Concentrate on the serenity prayer. Uh, know what, what your limits are, what you can control, what you can't, and especially be kind to yourself during this time. And I highly recommend a website um, on self-compassion by Kristen Neff called Self-Compassion. She has a bunch of guided imagery uh, and meditation options. And one that's very powerful is the loving kindness meditation, which is a standard, um, a common meditation among a lot of meditative traditions, but um, it's a very powerful one. She also has one called compassionate friend, which is if you were talking, if a compassionate friend were talking to you about yourself and the things that you don't like about yourself or how you're managing, what would that friend say? And what you come to realize is all of that you project onto what the friend is saying comes from you. You have it in you. Um, so discovering your own resilience, I think, is an opportunity here. Um, I will stop there and turn it over to Karen. Okay, thanks, Marjorie. Um, so uh, I'm, I've got some slides I'm going to show, but you're going to hear interestingly almost exactly the same thing marjorie just said <laughs> um with pictures um and so i think that speaks to um 
you know, great minds think alike or just, you know, it's, it's what we all need to hear. So I've got pictures um, that I'm going to hopefully share. Let's see. I had never heard of Zoom until March 15th. And um, now my whole life is on Zoom. So, um, okay. Can you guys see the slides? Uh, yeah. We sure, we sure can. Okay. Um, so, um, lots of um, advice and hopefully when you leave here, Marjorie and I would have also given you some encouragement. And so that is our goal. Um, so I work a lot with children and when the children come into the, my wonderful playroom, which is sitting empty, um, we do a feelings check-in and um, I ask the children, now this is for my older kids, the little ones have one that's much simpler, um, but we work on how are you feeling today, right? It's, it's great because emojis are so popular. Um, we practice reading the words sometimes to get the feelings vocabulary kind of cemented in their brain, uh, especially as children, they are learning, right? The vocabulary feelings. Um, but for me, it's also a great jumping off point to know how clients are doing and maybe I was going to focus my session in one area, but I'm seeing that we need to kind of shift uh, to a different area today. So I'm going to invite you to look over these. Um, and I'm going to invite you to think about, I know it's early in the morning, so maybe you're not having too many feelings yet. Um, but, you know, think about yesterday or think about, you know, up until this point today, what feelings are you having? Now we are multidimensional, right? And we can have feelings on the left hand of the chart as well as feelings on the right side all at the same time, right? We're, our feelings are like a big pizza that's been cut into slices, right? And so part of me can feel angry and depressed. Part of me can feel lucky and happy. Um, and that's quite normal, but I'm going to invite you to think about how you're feeling um, and maybe just start noticing, you know, each day how you're feeling. Uh, naming it can be really powerful. There we go. Um, <clears throat> for some of us, part of our feelings may be these uh, what we would identify as negative feelings. Um, and I want to normalize that as therapists, but also just as people who talk to other people, I suspect that we're all seeing an increase in some of these negative feelings. And I just want to normalize that, you know, it's pretty common. And as Marjorie said, be kind to yourself um, and don't beat yourself up. I, um, again, this is just a recent note that I, I took after seeing a client. Um, there are no right or wrong feelings, right? We feel what we feel. Um, it's, it's what you do with those feelings. Are those feelings getting so big that you need professional help that they're impacting your life in a negative way? So again, don't beat yourself up if you're having negative feelings. Um, but as Marjorie said, notice if the feelings are getting so big that you need professional help um, or that you need to implement some additional coping strategies. Our good friend Socrates um, had some words of wisdom. Again, as Marjorie was saying, we're, we're drawing from the ancients. Um, the secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And we are all building a new skill set for the pandemic, how to live, how to parent, how to work. And, you know, some days I find myself being really cranky that I'm having to let go of the old. And 
think about the new and always wear a mask and extra hand washing and not getting to hug people that don't live in my home. And so it's hard. Um, but if we can look forward and start uh, building things towards the new, it, it helps our mental health. But that speaks to um, <clears throat> uh, grief, right? Letting go, I think, uh, is a grieving process. And uh, I was driving to my office last week. We were giving out food to some of our families. Uh, and there's my dog. Um, and I just, I burst out crying in the car, right? I miss my amazing office. I miss my coworkers. I miss seeing the families that I work with. I miss seeing my kids. Um, and, you know, I, I was like driving along singing a song in my car and all of a sudden it just like hit me in the side of the head, um, the grief. And so I want to remind us that grief is not linear, right? We know there are five stages to grief. Uh, but it's a big hot mass and it hits us when we're not expecting it. And um, we might think, oh, we, we've gotten to the anger stage and then suddenly we're back to the beginning. Um, so again, be kind to yourself when grief pops up. This does not come from my clinical training but I find that often this is um, <laughs> how grief impacts me. Um, so there you have it. Excellent. <laughs> um, as Marjorie talked about, we wanna be kind to ourselves and I would invite you to read this aloud to yourself. I release the need to blame anyone, including myself. We are all doing the best we can with the understanding, knowledge, and awareness we have. Um, I, I hope that often during the day you are hearing from someone or from yourself or from a friend that we're all doing the best we can. And it's true. Um, when I'm working with clients, especially with the children, I say to them, you know, if I say something to you that I've said before, it's not because I've forgotten I've said it. It's because it's so important that I want to make sure you understand. And so when people say be kind to yourself, it's not because they think you haven't heard it or that um, it's the first time you've thought of that. It's because it's really important. And we want you to understand that we're doing the best we can. That might mean that you have oatmeal five nights in a row for dinner, right? Or that on a beautiful Saturday, you have to sit on the couch and watch, binge watch Grandchester for six hours. Maybe that's the best you can do for that day. And then the next day you'll do better, but be kind to yourself uh, because we all are doing our best. Our kids are doing their best. So if you work with kids, have grandkids, live with kids, um, you know, this is hard for our children as well. And, and just a reminder that um, our children aren't giving us a hard time, they are having a hard time. And that all behavior, even for grownups, is a form of communication, right? We know that children's brains are not developed such that they can articulate their feelings um, as yet. And they can articulate their feelings often through play so maybe if a child in your world is having a really difficult time, you can offer them paper and crayons or Play-Doh or Legos or invite them to play with their dolls. And I wonder if you can show me with crayons and paper how this is feeling for you. I wonder if your dolls could show me what it feels like right now. I wonder if using Legos, you could build what it feels like to have these big feelings. Um, so um, looking, knowing that underneath all of our behaviors um, is a lot more than we see on the surface. Um, as adults, we hopefully in theory have the language capacity to express what we're feeling. Um, but even then, sometimes as grownups, we may just need to spend time 
you know, coloring or painting or uh, moving our bodies through yoga or doing some mindfulness. Uh, because there's often a lot going on underneath the surface that, that we don't see. If you work with children uh, or have children in your lives, um, anything by Daniel Siegel is worth your time to read, to podcast, to audiobook, to YouTube. Um, he's a psychiatrist who does work in uh, neurobiology and interpersonal neurobiology and helps uh, give language on how to interact with children. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty amazing because it works with grownups too, right? Um, one of the things he talks about is listening with the intent to understand, not to reply. And um, of course that's important for our children, but it's also important with adults. And as we all are maybe feeling like we've got this amazing stress and want to kind of vomit our words on other people. I invite you to really listen when people are talking instead of crafting your reply during, especially during this hard time. Um, just a little more on children, um, but it also works for adults too, right? Um, when someone is really dysregulated, when they are very angry or very sad, um, the term is they've flipped their lid, right? Their brain is offline. The decision-making, the thinking, prefrontal cortex part of their brain is offline. And whether you're a grown up or a child, you can't listen to reason. Um, and so on these, in these times, it's important to show empathy, right? Yeah, I, I hear you say that you're really frustrated that you don't get to go to your office anymore. Yeah, I really hear that you're so angry that all of your school is on Zoom, right? I really hear that you're frustrated that you don't get to, to go home and visit your parents for Thanksgiving, right? We're listening to understand and we're reflecting back that we do understand. Um, and during this time when we all need extra compassion for one another, I think just that reflection back of what you heard the person say um, is really important. Um, here are some just examples. Um, instead of saying, stop crying, it's okay to be sad. I know this is really hard. Tell me about it, right? Um, so I wonder, again, this is kind of, the picture is kind of kid focused, but even with grownups in our lives, you know, how can we offer empathy and support during this time? And part of that is just letting the other person know that we're there and that we hear them and we see the feelings that they're having. Um, you know, right now our brains are in this fight, flight, freeze mode, and it's a, it's a stress response. And, um, when we are in this mode, it can be hard for us to focus. Uh, it can be hard. Our breathing may change. We might find our breathing is more shallow sometimes when we're feeling stressed. Um, it can impact our sleep. Some of us want to sleep all the time. Some of us have trouble sleeping. Some of us, when we sleep, have dreams that make us not want to go to sleep. Um, I, I call it, you know, when I was pregnant with my kids, I, you know, you have the pregnancy brain where you can't remember stuff. I now have the COVID brain, right? I, I can't remember stuff. And, um, you know, so my, my friends and kids will be like, oh, yeah, that was a COVID brain moment for mom. Um, and again, offer yourself grace. It's really hard. Our brains and our bodies are, as Marjorie said, fighting this invisible thing that we can't see. And so it's this weird paradox of it looks safe outside and yet mm -hmm. I have right and yet I have to wear a mask and our brains are just exhausted. Um, I found this on Twitter 
uh, March 25th. Um, and I saved it because I thought it just really summarized what's going on in our brains right now. Do you want to know why you feel so tired, even though your daily activity mm. load is decreased? It's a trauma response mm. because you can't fight the virus actively. And because you can't run away from it, your body is going into play dead mode. Um, and so again, I, I want to give you some ability to give yourself grace um, and know that this, our brains are really working overtime during all of this. Um, it's exhausting to view the world as a potential threat, especially when you can't, as Marjorie said, you can't see the threat necessarily. But Winnie the Pooh offers some lovely <laughs> advice for us. And I say, if you can't take a nap during a pandemic, when can you take a nap, right? <laughs> and honestly, your brain probably needs some extra rest. So, it, you know, if you can steal away from kids or work and take an afternoon nap, I would say do it. Uh, as Marjorie said, we want to uh, be kind to ourselves. Um, exactly what would you say to a friend if you heard your friend berating themselves? I'm not, right, I'm not redecorating my house. I'm not exercising every day. I'm not eating, you know, broccoli three times a day. Um, we would say to our friends, you're doing the best you can. And so I invite you to say that to yourself and to mean it. Um, again, balance. Some days you eat salads and go to the gym. Some days you eat cupcakes and refuse to put on pants. <laughs> and so um, it's a balance, right? And find <coughs> to yourself and offer yourself grace. Um, I think this actually speaks to what we're going through now as well. Um, if you're giving your all, but it takes all you have just to get through the day, it doesn't mean your best isn't good enough. It means life is just that hard right now and be good to yourself, right? Um, we're fighting this invisible virus. We've got racism, you know, act, we got race activism going on. We've got this election. There's a lot going on. So again, it's hard. It seems hard. It is hard. Be kind to yourself. Talking about the ancient fathers, um, I love the book Steel by Lauren Winter, and she talks about the desert saints. And this is like ancient CBT mindfulness. Um, the desert saints said that the beginning of renouncing a thought is simply noticing it. So that's mindfulness, right? We're going to notice the thought it's like a, a wave we're just going to watch the wave i'm noticing and naming it um, but i'm not going to invite it in to stay um, and then the desert father say something more after noticing that thought replace it with a prayer um, and i think that's good advice for us to notice those thoughts but not to invite them in to stay and how can we replace those thoughts? Lauren Winter talks about uh, a practice called saying the ones. Um, when a thought comes, replace it with a prayer or with the word one over and over. And she writes, it does not escape me that one is a spiritual word, that one is what God is, that one is unity and wholeness, that my ones are not just a palliative litany, but some kind of truthfulness and a statement of hope. And so for me, I have found that's really easy just to say the ones when I'm finding myself, berating myself, having negative self-talk, wanting to invite the grief or the anger in. Um, if I can sort of watch it wave away and replace it for, with the word one, um, for me, that has been helpful. Um, it's also the grass is greener where you water it. That's, it's the same thing as mindfulness that we, 
where we spend our time, what we water in our brain, the thoughts that we tend to are the thoughts that grow. And so just as Marjorie said, I invite you to tend to the thoughts of gratitude and thankfulness. You know, maybe each night when you sit down for a meal or before you go to bed, um, name something that you have been thankful for in that specific day. Um, this is just a little mm. girl that I think is cute and I love her. Open your soul to peace in the morning and recall it throughout the day. Uh, I'm almost done, but I just want to talk quickly. Marjorie again talked about things we can control, things we can't control. Um, we can control turning off the news, shutting down Twitter. Uh, we can control not talking to friends that just overwhelm us. We can control how we treat other people. Um, we can't control, I love this one, the amount of toilet paper in the store, <laughs> right? <laughs> We can't control what other people do that we know is unsafe, um, but we can control what we can control. And if we focus on that, um, it can bring us peace and calm. Um, when the world feels like an emotional roller coaster, steady yourself with simple rituals. Do the dishes, fold the laundry, water the plants. Um, kind of the quotidian things that um, can bring peace. Uh, Kathleen Norris, you know, in her books talks about the ordinary activities um, that can bring peace and calm and maybe bring us more in touch with, um, with our relationship with God during this time. Um, we know that when we hug people that we trust and feel safe with, um, our body releases oxytocin, which is a which is a good feeling hormone. And so, if you have people in your life that you love and trust, um, giving them a hug can be a positive coping strategy. Um, and I know this is a really hard time for all of us, and I'm hoping that we can, um, you know, live in hope and not in fear. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, I'm almost done. We're going to click through this. Um, so Sylvia Borstein, and this is how I'm going to close, um, is she grew up Jewish and is now a Buddhist practitioner. She's also a psychotherapist. Um, and she writes, may you feel safe. May you feel content. May you feel strong and may you live with ease. And so I hope for all of us, that's we can find that during this time of, of pandemic living. And just as Marjorie said, if you find that your big feelings are lasting longer than two weeks, um, here's a text number you can send. You can text and get information back. Um, you know, there are a million therapists in this area. You can reach out to your to our church and they can help you. So if you need help, I invite you to reach out. Thank you. Awesome. Um, let's see, get back to Marjorie and Karen. Thank you so much for those uh, wonderful presentations. We have just a few minutes, um, five or six minutes uh, for a conversation. Um, and questions, I thought I would, uh, as everyone else is, you can either uh, write a question in a chat or unmute yourself or write it privately to me and I can ask it on your behalf. Um, I thought I would start with um, a question I've been thinking a lot about lately and that is, you know, as a pastor, I believe, um, and uh, I think this is really well reflected in um, your slides and uh, conversation that when we take a posture of like hope and forgiveness and mercy, it affects the way that we see the world. Like it makes us like more able to experience those things and thus like creates the thing that we're hoping that we're like projecting. But all, so on the one hand, I think that that's true. On the other hand, I recognize like 
I, so much of the world I don't control. And no matter how much hope I throw into it, it's not going to change the way that it is. Could you talk about that balance of like, kind of making the world as we want it to be and also like dealing with that we, you know, fundamentally the world is as it is. I'm not sure how clear that question is, but it's always well, something that's intrigued me. Yeah. Um, what comes to my mind right away, first of all, Karen, wow. I loved your presentation. And one of the good things about this kind of opportunity is you get connected with people that you didn't even know were in the world in a way that is just so enriching. So thank you. Um, what comes to mind, Joshua, and what you're saying is the, um, I think it's a one-two process at least, that you have to acknowledge what you're experiencing. And if it isn't hopeful, you have to be honest about that because that's the only way you can clear it. If you deny what you're experiencing, it takes on power and it seeps out in other ways. So the first thing is to fully feel it. And then I think there's a natural kind of process that happens and other feelings can come into play like hopefulness and offering grace. Um, so it's a, it, it's a, it's a uh, dialectic. You, off, you feel one thing, you feel another thing, then you try to synthesize it. The main thing is authenticity, I think, being really authentic and um, offering that. What do you think, Karen? Well, I was just, um, yeah, I was thinking about there's an image of an ostrich with his head in the sand and um, it was talking about all of the energy that it takes to, to bury our heads in the sand against our problems. And we could be using that energy to maybe grow positive coping strategies or to, or to help make things better, right? So the, the energy that we take to deny could be used for good. And so I think what Marjorie said is right, it takes on power and we know that it, the body remembers it's, it can sit in our body, right? It can impact us in a very physical way um, if we try to pretend that that's not there. And so I think you name it to tame it and take away the power. I think that's exactly right. It's not easy. No, this is a loose association, but one of the messages I got that I loved from the um, Won't You Be My Neighbor movie was anything mentionable is manageable. Yeah, right. I think that's so important. Giving giving words to the what seem like huge feelings can bring them down to size and make it possible to hold and process and release. So right. 